<laughs> Can everyone hear me? Hopefully I'm not too loud. I sound very loud. Am I too loud? No? Okay, good. I'm a little bit of a loud talker, so hopefully there won't be any feedback or anything. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. <laughs> Out. I hope that uh, I can live up to that introduction uh, with some of <laughs> with some of my humble humble research ideas. Um, so let me just start off by thanking you guys for coming tonight. I really appreciate your desire to learn more about this particular research and and hear me talk. I'll try not to block you over there, but I might have to stand in front and point some things out. Um, so today I'm going to talk about vitamin D, if you didn't get that from looking at the bulletin already. And I've listed this um, as 10 things your mother never told you. And that might sound a little cliche, a little cheesy, and that's okay. But the reason that I wanted to list it in that way or, or phrase it in that way is because of my mother. And I think if, for those of you in the room who are privileged enough to have grown up with your mothers, I know some people don't have that privilege, and to be as privileged as I am to still have my mother living today, um, you know that your mothers have drilled into you many, many important things about food and about diet. And that was certainly my first interaction and conversation about diet and health was with my mother. And so she told me sort of the traditional things, right? Veggies will make you tall and strong. We all have heard that. Liver is good for you. I hate liver. Milk is good for you. <laughs> I used to hate milk, but I drink it now. Mushrooms are good for you. I still hate mushrooms. Soda will rot your teeth. I don't drink soda anymore, so that's good. Coffee will stunt your growth. And my personal favorite, which was eat all of your food because there are children starving who would, rat, who would have it. Everyone in here has probably heard that one variation or another. But the one thing that I wanted to point out is despite all of these very general uh, discussions around food, or guidelines, I should say, around food, uh, did your mothers ever tell you specifically about vitamin D? So maybe as a show of hands, did anyone's mother in here, yours did? As a child, that's awesome, that's great. Okay, we have about four people in the room, so maybe five people, so maybe about 3% <laughs> of the room, maybe maybe 5%, five, 5%, five percent, five to 10%. So um, my mother did not specifically talk about vitamin D, but what you'll get from some of the things she told me and the reason she told me these things is because vitamin D is actually a, part, a component of liver, a component of milk, a component of mushrooms in a certain form. And so what we're at, we're at a stage right now in research where we're starting to get into more fine details of what these nutrients do in our bodies and why they're so important. And that's what my research is about. <clears throat> so I'm going to go through these 10 things uh, in different speeds and different amounts, but what is vitamin D? Where can I get some? What does the body do with it? How is it used? Uh, how much do I need? Am I deficient? That's a word that comes up a lot with vitamin D these days. How much is too much? What may be keeping me from getting enough vitamin D in my diet or in my body? How common is deficiency? What happens if we don't have enough? How does that affect our health? What happens if I don't have enough specifically during pregnancy, which is a concern for a lot of new mothers? And are there long-term consequences of deficiency? So much of the work that I'm going to some, somewhat summarize uh, today has been done already. So most of this work is, uh, has been widely, thoroughly researched. We're still getting some pieces filling in the gaps here and there. But my research specifically focused on these, these two areas. So what happens during pregnancy, and then are there long-term consequences of deficiency? So I'll get to some of my own research in the end, but I'll start you off with so, sort of an introduction around these components. <clears throat> so let's see how much time we have. All right, so what is vitamin D? Vitamin D is known as an essential nutrient, and I put that in quotations for a reason. We'll get to that. Um, there are 10 different forms of vitamin D. I'm not showing more than 10 different forms of vitamin D. I'm not showing all of them here. I'm just showing some of the major players. Um, the main difference between these forms are some of them are inactive forms, uh, meaning that they don't have a known activity or a known function in the body. But there are some forms that are known as active forms, and this is uh, the major active form of vitamin D. So this is the form that's in your body that's actually playing the major roles. It's known as calcitrol or 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. Um, if you've ever had your vitamin D measured before at the doctors, this is the form that's being measured for the most part. This is 25-hydroxy vitamin D. It's an, act, an inactive form. 
But these f different forms lead to this active form, so they're all related, and I'll tell you about how they are related. Where can I get some of this vitamin D? So vitamin D, you can get it either through diet or supplements. Those are one way to get it, um, and this is just a list of different dietary uh, uh, sources of vitamin D, so fatty fish, cod liver oil, eggs, and then, of course, oral supplements I think most people are familiar with. You can get it through mushrooms, but they have to be irradiated um, to generate the vitamin D that your body would use. And then, obviously, in the United States, a lot of foods are fortified. So milk is fortified with vitamin D. Um, it does not come naturally in uh, cow's milk. So obviously, as I said, one way is dietary intake, and you can get either D3 or D2. So there's different forms of vitamin D that you can also get through your diet. Um, and I can talk to you afterwards about those two forms later, but I'm not going to go into that now. Um, one of the ways that some people, a lot of people know now, but I definitely didn't know when I was growing up, was that you can get it through sun exposure. Um, and so the way that works is that vitamin D can actually be synthesized in your skin um, during sun exposure. And um, that's why I brought up this question of, is vitamin D really a vitamin? Because when we think about vitamins, we think about a dietary source of something that our body needs. Also, when we think about essential nutrients, that means it must come through the diet. And so what a lot of the newer studies, and actually studies that have been going on for a long time, not really newer, but a, a larger body of work is showing now, is that a lot of our vitamin D as humans is coming through sun exposure. And so if you're not getting it through your diet, you have to get it through sun exposure. And most of us are not getting it through our diet, at least not sufficient levels that we need. And so actually, there's a reaction between 7-D-hydrocholesterol, which is, which is made in your body, um, that gets converted into a pre-vitamin D, that gets converted into the type of vitamin D that our body uh, will utilize down, down, the, down the road. <clears throat> and so you can get this through sunlight exposure. Uh, they also make these uh, handy vitamin D lamps, which have a similar... Uh, amount of UVB radiation, and that's what converts this particular compound into pre-vitamin D. Um, and you can get a little bit of it through sun tanning. I don't recommend tanning beds because they're also linked to skin cancer um, and also not too much time in the sun, but there is evidence that you can get the particular UVB wavelengths that you need from sun tanning um, in order to convert 7-dehydrocholesterol to pre-vitamin D. So those are some of the ways you can get vitamin D. I get this question from Martin sometimes, <laughs> which is, I want some, but what about nocturnal animals who don't have sun exposure? And a lot of these animals are known to not really have vitamin D sources in their diet. Um, there's very few dietary sources of vitamin D, actually. So one very common nocturnal animal that I think everyone will recognize is a bat. Right? These only come out at night. At night. They're not known to fly during the day. So that would be your extreme case of a nocturnal animal. It's not out in the day. It's not sleeping during the day. Um, well, this group did a study where they looked at two different types of bats, one that lives in caves, tombs, and buildings, and one type that lives in trees. And they exposed these bats intentionally to um, sunlight over the course of time, um, over a course of 90 days. And they saw that their vitamin D levels for one of the types of bats went up, and for the other type of bat, it... Um, went up a little bit in the beginning, but didn't really go up as much as the first type. So a lot of you would probably maybe take a guess at which one of these types of bats was the one that went way up versus the one that sort of plateaued out. And I'll... The one in the cave? Who says cave? Who says tree? Okay, it's about 50-50. <laughs> so... Um, depending on your decision for trees, actually, the cave bats had the increase in vitamin D. Um, and so you would expect it to be the one in the trees. I also thought it would be the one in the trees, but it was the bats in the cave that had the increase in vitamin D. And so what they learned, and I think I may have another slide. No, I don't. Um, what they learned from this was essentially that some bats, do have, or some nocturnal animals do have the ability to generate more vitamin D than they normally have, because this is how much they normally have, right? They're both at the same level, and others don't. But either way, it's suggesting that different species and different organisms metabolize or generate vitamin D at different levels, but then they also may need 
have different needs of vitamin D or different, uh, need different levels of vitamin D because these bats aren't generating any extra, but they're just fine, right? They're living, they're breeding, and they're happy in their trees. <clears throat> so in going into this question of what does the body do with vitamin D, I just wanted to make it clear that vitamin D is conserved across many species. I just showed you some data from bats. Um, but the mechanisms that generate or uh, handle vitamin D in the body are conserved across vertebrates, non-vertebrates, uh, frogs, um, fish, different types of aquatic animals, cows, dogs, mice, humans. So it's the, an extensive list, and this probably isn't the most up-to-date phylogeny, um, but an extensive list of the uh, species that vitamin D um, is necessary in um, it ranges from, has a wide range from vertebrates to invertebrates. And so it's not something that's um, specific to humans, right? Your cats need vitamin D, your dogs need vitamin D, and so on. Um, and you'll see, as I'll show you later, that mice need vitamin D. So what does your body do with it? It's got this form of vitamin D that comes through the skin. It's got a form of vitamin D that comes through your diet. Um, and they both have to get to the liver. Um, this goes, is absorbed through the, the gut into the and transported to the liver. And then it's converted into that inactive form that most of our doctors will measure if you're getting tested for vitamin D levels. What happens after that in the body is that it has to get transported to your kidney, and there it gets converted into that active form of vitamin D. Um, this form of vitamin D is pretty unstable, which is why your doctors measure this level. And what actually can happen is some of it can get stored in fat and muscle, some of it becomes inactivated, and even some of this version down here can become inactivated and excreted. And so there are certain types of vitamin D that your body hangs on to, and then your body is also responsible for converting the vitamin D to get rid of it. And that's one way that you don't accumulate toxic levels of vitamin D. So your body wants to hang on to the vitamin D it needs and nothing more. <clears throat> All right, so in talking about this active form, um, one of the things I said before was that vitamin D is sometimes not known as a nutrient. There's some speculation or some controversy about whether we should call it a nutrient or a vitamin. Um, but it's also known as a steroid hormone, particularly this active form of vitamin D. And that's because it acts like a lot of hormones in your body that we are all familiar with, testosterone, estrogen, um, insulin, melatonin. Those are all hormones in the body. And what that means is that they're secreted by your body, but then they circulate to different parts of your body to have their effect. And so that's what happens with vitamin D. Um, whether you're taking it in through the diet or you're uh, generating it in the skin, it's getting transported to all parts of the body. And we now know that vitamin D actually has two major mechanisms of how it works in the body. One way, um, one of the most well-studied way, I would say, is that it affects calcium absorption in your body. Um, another, I would say, maybe less well-studied uh, area is insulin secretion, but that's an area I'm very interested in. Um, and in terms of calcium absorption, that's why you are sometimes given a calcium pill or a vitamin D pill with your calcium pill because you need vitamin D to actually absorb calcium in your intestines. Um, the other way that vitamin D acts is actually by targeting genes in your cell. And so we'll get into this a little bit when I start talking about my research. But vitamin D forms a complex with some other compounds and it goes into the nucleus of the cell and it binds directly to the DNA and it can turn genes on or off. And that's how it also has another wide, uh, uh, diverse array of functions in cell growth, immune function, some of these other uh, health outcomes that we hear about vitamin D being involved in. <clears throat> and there's a lot that we don't know about this area and there's a lot that we don't know about this area. So people are still studying these two mechanisms very widely. As I said before, it acts as a hormone. It affects pretty much all of the tissues in the body that have been studied to date. You can find vitamin D um, levels in those different tissues, and it can ex um, have an effect on gene expression in many different tissues in the body. All right, so how much vitamin D do I need? Um, this question is a little bit, when I first started studying vitamin D, it did not seem controversial, but it's a little bit more of a controversial question now because I don't think there's a really good consensus on how much vitamin D we need. So I would say it's still under investigation. Um, and the guidelines vary quite a bit in how much vitamin D um, an individual should have. Um, regardless of whether you're getting it through sun or diet, um, what's recommended is that your blood or blood levels are measured 
and that they exceed 50 nanomoles per liter or 20 nanograms per mil. It's the same measurement, just in different units. Um, and when I say there's a little bit of variation in the guidelines, as you can see here, in terms of what these four different groups are suggesting as sufficient versus deficient, your sufficient levels kind of vary between these four groups, or what they're recommending as sufficient, slightly, not by very much, but slightly. And your deficient levels also vary quite a bit uh, between these two groups. Um, and so it just depends on um, what your recommendation is <laughs> from your doctor. But I would say the Institute of Medicine recommends these levels, and that's based on tests to look at a response to vitamin D. One of the things that I'm learning with my research as it goes on is that there are many different effects of vitamin D deficiency. And so a lot of these uh, recommendations may have been uh, set based on looking at one outcome, whereas now we know that vitamin D affects so many different pathways in the body, being able to test all thousands of those pathways is somewhat challenging. Um, and particularly comparing between things like an adult versus a child, how much do they need, versus um, a pregnant woman. This is not necessarily my area of study, um, but there are a lot of really great studies uh, going on to confirm this, and I'll tell you some, some other ways that you might need different levels. So how much, do you, how much is too much? I think this is just it. Uh, so toxic levels result in something called hypercalcemia, which, as you can imagine, is related to calcium. Do not take more than 10,000 IUs per day for more than three months. That's sort of a recommendation on how to avoid toxic. But it takes a lot of vitamin D to get to this level. So I don't think most people are in danger of doing that through supplementation. <clears throat> so what keeps me from getting enough vitamin D? Um, what keeps me from getting what I need? Um, obviously, like I said, dietary intake, if you're not taking in enough uh, fatty fish uh, that contain vitamin D, liver, egg yolk, supplements. Um, if you're not getting enough sun exposure, that's another way. Um, and I think we're all, well, I'm definitely guilty of not getting enough sun exposure. Um, the other way that you can um, not get enough vitamin D, which we're growing in terms of understanding how this works, is that there are different uh, DNA sequence changes or mutations in the genes that are responsible for metabolizing the vitamin D and getting it from that form that you take in through your diet to the form that your body actually uses, that active form. And so mutations in these different genes have been linked to different levels of both the inactive form and the active form. And so we know sometimes there's intrinsic reasons. You can go and get lots of uh, vitamin D through the sun or through diet, but with certain mutations, you may still be limited in how much vitamin D is actually measured in your system. <clears throat> Some other things are like being outside at the wrong time of day. So studies have shown that different times of day result in different absorbing or generating, synthesizing different levels of vitamin D in your skin. So this is one study comparing exposure in Gainesville, Florida to Boston, Massachusetts. And even at the same time of day, there was differences in the vitamin D um, levels. Um, and at different times of day, as you can see, this is about one o'clock in the afternoon, that seemed to be the optimal time for getting vitamin D. This is also probably optimal time for getting sun cancer if you're out there without sunscreen on. So a lot of people will choose to go out in the early morning when there's a little less risk of that, but still get optimal vitamin D levels. <clears throat> the other thing is that they've shown that there's seasonal differences in exposure to the sunlight. Um, and this, in this particular example, this line here, oops, all right. This line here are individuals that are on supplement, so their vitamin D levels don't change over the months. This is going from July of one year, year one, to July of year two. And you're seeing that the people without supplements actually have a significant decrease in their vitamin D levels um, in the January to February, March months, right? So during the winter months. And that could be either because they're not exposed to enough sun from not going outside um, <clears throat> or for other reasons. <clears throat> So there's a really a long, long list of reasons why you might not be getting enough vitamin D. Um, sometimes it's easier to just take a supplement and raise your levels up. That would be the most easiest way to raise your levels. But you might also think about looking into some of these other reasons and seeing if there's ways that you can um, alter these particular conditions, at least things that are alterable. 
um, in order to up your vitamin D levels if you're deficient. So skin pigment um, can affect your ability to synthesize vitamin D um, because melanin competes with that metabolite I told you about that gets converted into vitamin D. Um, prolonged UVB exposure, um, it actually has a negative feedback where it starts to uh, destroy the vitamin D that you've made so that you don't become, get exposed to toxic levels. Wearing clothing from head to foot, covering all of your skin. Obviously, if your skin's not exposed, you cannot get exposed to UVB, so you won't get it. Uh, glass apparently blocks most uh, UVB rays, um, so just sitting in a cafe um, behind the glass might not be enough. Uh, sunscreen, I'm not saying don't use sunscreen, <laughs> I'm just giving you some ways that you change your vitamin D intake. Um, and so there's a number of different reasons. Some of them you cannot change, right? So there are things like intestinal malabsorption. So there are certain diseases um, associated with how your intestine absorbs vitamin D. Um, and that includes Crohn's disease. Um, there are also certain pharmaceuticals or certain drugs that people take that can affect how they absorb uh, vitamin D. Um, age is strongly associated with vitamin D levels, um, and I'll show you a slide in a second, as well as ethnicity. I have a couple of slides in a second, and I think I mentioned that already. <clears throat> All right, so this is one just showing very simple table showing how age is maybe associated with vitamin D. So we've got males up here going from 1 to 8, 9 to 13, 14 plus. These are children. Um, these are the average levels of vitamin D going from 7 to 60, and then these are the percent of individuals that are underneath that adequate level of vitamin D that's recommended by the Institute of Medicine. So you can see that fewer males at younger ages, in the younger age group, are at risk of uh, inadequacy, whereas a greater proportion of males are at risk in the older groups. And that's also true of females. Um, there's some evidence that females might differ a little bit in their vitamin D levels, but in this particular example, they're about the same. <clears throat> the other really good example is that when you look at individuals from different ethnic groups, you can also see differences, very large differences, in the proportion of individuals within that group that are um, at risk or deficient for vitamin D. And so in this case, if you think about European, people of European descent, people of African descent, Latino descent, and I'm not, I don't remember what this other category was from this paper, to be honest with you. Um, but what I wanted to point out here was that in comparing European descent to African descent, um, there's a big difference in the proportion of individuals. European descent had about 30% of individuals were at risk of deficiency or deficient. In African and Latino descent, it was about 80%. So that means there were only 20% that had levels over that recommendation uh, by IOM. <clears throat> and this, again, is an older paper. It's from 2010. There's probably more recent figures that might even be um, greater. Uh, the other thing that might affect your deficiency in trying to think about how common is vitamin D deficiency is your geographical uh, location. So this was a study where they looked at mothers in particular and, again, um, have graphed here the percent of mothers that fall below that um, suggested threshold. And so in the Americas, um, it was about 65%, I believe. However, in Southeast Asia and Western Pacific, it was as high as 85 to 90%. Um, in the U.S., um, in, this is just looking at uh, data from NHANES, excuse me, pregnant or women at the age of pregnancy, it fell around 30% of being inadequate in the U.S., 33%. Um, so, 31%, sorry. So, um, there's differences in where you are and whether your vitamin D levels are sufficient, sorry, the proportion of people who have sufficient versus deficient vitamin D. Um, yeah, sure. That's sure. That's okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Right, and a lot of people don't check unless they have a problem um, because it's not a standard, and that's what I was going to say is that there's no, there's not yet, not yet. So there's a lot of groups I, I've started to, um, in talk, just talking to different clinicians, um, more OBGYNs are maybe screening pregnant women for vitamin D, but um, as you know, in this country, sometimes there's also an issue of insurance and who's going to pay for it. And if it's not a standard screening recommended for pregnant women, which to my knowledge, it still is not yet, that can be an issue. Yes. That's great. That's great. Then they're starting to do that. That's wonderful. Um, and so a lot of groups are starting to supplement um, individuals for vitamin D. Go to the next thing. All right. So, and that kind of raises the question of what's happening here. So are, are all of these people deficient or should we all be on supplements, right? If 80%, if my, I'm clearly of African descent, if I have an 80% risk of being vitamin D deficient, should I just take supplements? Um, and so I'm not your doctor, and I'm not a medical doctor, but I think that there's evidence that we don't know enough yet about what these levels mean um, in order to just supplement people across the board. Um, and the reason why I say that is because there's starting to be newer evidence that is starting to look at how genetic differences contribute to your vitamin D levels and whether or not that's directly linked to your health outcomes. And so this is one study um, I'll just start with this graph. They basically started by looking at um, vitamin D levels between individuals from different ethnic backgrounds. They showed that obviously the levels in the people of African descent was quite low. Uh, European descent was much higher and actually significantly higher. And when they look at things like the link between vitamin D, the vitamin D levels in these individuals and their bone mineral content, which is one readout of vitamin D deficiency, um, they found that even though these individuals had much lower levels of vitamin D on average, their bone mineral content was not associated with their vitamin D levels. Whereas these individuals, there was a very strong correlation between their bone mineral content and their vitamin D levels. So the evidence, I think, is not um, all there yet in terms of really understanding what this means, but I think there's there are more and more studies that need to be done to kind of understand what's going on with ethnic differences in vitamin D levels. Um, there is indeed an increased risk of disease and disorders, and many studies have shown this with different health outcomes. One of them, the primary one that has been studied extensively is bone health, and that includes rickets, which is a primary uh, readout of vitamin D deficiency um, as for as long back as we known that vitamin D was important, right? This was one of the diseases that was the initial outcome of vitamin D deficiency uh, diagnosis. Um, osteoporosis, which is low bone mineral, osteomalacia, which is muscle atrophy. Um, immune health, oops, I went really fast. Immune health, someone just asked me about autoimmune disorders and infection. Cardiometabolic health has been linked to vitamin D deficiency, including diabetes. Um, and heart disease, neurological health is now being linked to vitamin D deficiency, cancer, including colon, breast, lung, prostate, that's a short list of different types of cancers, reproductive health, and then the very bottom here, fetal development. So when I say increased risk for disease, that means there's an association between these diseases and your vitamin D status. That does not yet mean that vitamin D deficiency causes this disease. It means that if you have lower vitamin D, your chance of getting this disease might be a little bit higher. So it's not an automatic disease uh, diagnosis. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So rickets is um, a, primarily a bone, muscle, respiratory, and um, growth disease if you get it um, when you're younger. Um, it's from, so basically when I said before that vitamin D regulates the level of calcium, that your body can absorb, it's related to rickets. That's one of the causes of that outcome. All right, so what happens if I don't have enough during pregnancy? Um, this is another question that's still under uh, development and that my lab is very interested in understanding because we know a lot about now what 
the association between low vitamin D um, in an adult and disease outcome, we know very little about how low vitamin D during pregnancy affects that child. Um, and so as I said before, if you look at the data, there's a pretty high percent of mothers that are at risk for inadequacy um, if you use these figures. And low vitamin D during pregnancy has been shown to be associated with increased risk for gestational diabetes, um, small for gestational age, low birth weight, and preterm birth. Um, and so many of these birth outcomes have been associated with the health of that individual later on in life. And so these are some of the things that doctors look for in terms of diagnosing how well that child is going to develop and their risk for disease later on. <clears throat> but we don't quite know how low vitamin D is maybe contributing to these different outcomes. And we certainly don't know what happens um, uh, long term to these children after this outcome as a result specifically of vitamin D deficiency. <clears throat> So in terms of understanding what's enough during pregnancy, um, this is another uh, uh, study that was done looking at differences between individuals and whether pregnancy levels of vitamin D contribute to something called small for gestational age, which means that the baby is smaller than the, um, uh, what do you call it, the um, projected growth charts for a newborn child. <clears throat> And so what they found in comparing uh, women of European descent and women of African descent was that, again, women of European descent were at higher risk of association, uh, sorry, they were significantly associated with having, uh, their vitamin D levels were significantly associated with having small for gestational age. However, in the African American uh, population, their children were not associated, their vitamin D levels were not associated with small for gestational age. That doesn't mean that deficiency in African, people of African descent is not associated. This is just one study showing that comparison. So it's just an idea to make you think about what these levels could be causing and how they may differ between individuals. So we're not all created equal. We all have differences in how we handle nutrients and how we interact with nutrients. <clears throat> so and our final question under the introduction is, are there still, are there long-term consequences? And again, this is something that's still under investigation. This is what my lab is particularly interested in. Whether if you have vitamin D deficiency during pregnancy, how does that affect the long-term health of your child? <clears throat> there are a number of studies now, not specifically looking at vitamin D, but looking at either uh, famine, which is complete caloric restriction during pregnancy, um, that show that uh, restrictions during pregnancy can actually have an effect on adult health of the children that were born at that time. So one popular one is the Dutch famine. This is a uh, famine that occurred in the Netherlands during World War II. Um, there was severe restriction of calories. I believe their calorie count went down to something like 800 calories a day if they were lucky to get that. And there were children conceived and born during that famine. And so this particular cohort study has followed up those children and looked at their disease or health outcomes um, after a, a, a period of time, over time. And they found that these individuals, children that were conceived or carried during that famine were at increased risks for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cholesterol, obesity, pulmonary disease, sorry, renal disease, stress, and uh, breast cancer, just to name a few of the diseases that they're looking at. The other thing that they found that was really important was that timing was a uh, uh, timing of when that famine or that uh, 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 starvation occurred during pregnancy was important. And so they were able to show that when they split up the timing of the exposure to famine between early in, uh, sorry, early in pregnancy, mid-pregnancy, and late in pregnancy, they found that there was an association between um, the famine, ha being exposed to the famine and cardiovascular disease only um, at early gestation and not at any other periods. Um, and so one of the reasons for that, as many of you probably already know, is that the embryo is going through different developmental stages during pregnancy. And so one of the things that people are starting to appreciate and really starting to fully understand is, are there stages of pregnancy that are more or less susceptible to dietary deficiencies like vitamin D. Um, we're not there yet. I don't have any data to show you, so it's a little, little bit of a tease. But I think that it's important also to be thinking about 
if you are deficient, is there a time where it's more critical during your pregnancy to have those normal levels? Or is there a time where it's less important? Um, during this uh, development, um, there's rapid and widespread changes in the embryo that are, require optimal levels of nutrients, as you can imagine. The other thing that we're starting to appreciate is that it might not be just during gestation that's important. It might also be important to have optimal nutrient levels during preconception, optimal nutrient levels during lactation. And so a lot of groups are looking at the breadth of this window during early development and understanding how nutrient availability during this window affects the outcome of the child. <clears throat> All right, so as I said, this window is still under investigation. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of data from my lab in the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes we have. Um, not only asking about how vitamin D deficiency during this generation affects child outcome, but also how that might affect multiple generations. Um, of children. And so that's really the focus of my lab research. <clears throat> right, so, so the question here is what about my grandchildren, right? Are they, are they um, being affected by what's happening during my pregnancy? <clears throat> so my lab studies this by looking at the genome and the epigenome. Um, many of you are familiar with the genome being made up of DNA. Um, and this is a code that determines how cells function. That's how I, I like to describe it. So every cell in your body has a genome, and that's made up of this long strand of DNA. Um, and the genes that determine how your cell function are encoded by this long strand of DNA. Um, we have a number of chromosomes in the genome. Humans are slightly different than mice, and these encode uh, as many as 20,000 genes in humans. So a lot of genes are encoded in this stretch of DNA. <clears throat> we also st study something called the epigenome. Um, and so with the epigenome, it's a little bit different than the genome because it's factors that regulate how the genome is interpreted. So now you have that code of DNA. Your cell has to understand how to interpret that code. And so the epigenome helps the cell understand how to interpret that code of DNA. And so there's a lot going on in this figure, just bear with me. Um, I'm not gonna necessarily go through all of it, but these are just some examples of how the genome is regulated by the epigenome. So one type of epigenetic uh, regulatory mechanism is the fact that your genome is a very, very long strand of this code. And in the nucleus, it's wrapped up into segments. One of the ways that it's wrapped up into segments is using these little balls called nucleosomes. And so the genome DNA is actually wrapped around these balls um, of nucleosomes. And these nucleosomes have very special modifications made to them. And those modifications tell the cell when it should be wrapped up and when it should be open so that the cell can read it. And so in one way, in most simplest way of thinking about it, just wrapping it around these little balls is not enough. There's another target or another signal that tells the cell, at this stage in my cell life, I wanna have this piece of DNA open, right? Because we've got 20,000 genes to figure out which ones are gonna be on and which ones are gonna be off. And so that's just one example. Um, the type of epigenetic modification that my lab studies is called DNA methylation. And I'll show you a really short cartoon of it. Um, so DNA methylation, again, is an epigenetic modification. It's a feature that regulates gene activity. It tells the cell how to, under, how to interpret the DNA. Um, in this case, let's say this particular gene, um, this individual has what's called a methylated copy, um, and this individual has what we call an unmethylated or a not methylated copy. And I've just colored this in to mean that it's methylated, it's modified, unmodified. And what that does is it tells the cell then to turn on this gene and turn off this gene, right? And so what my lab tries to understand is what are these marks across that genome, which is 20,000 plus genes, and how does it affect whether the gene is on or off? And what we know about diet is that diet, different types of diet can change whether that is modified or unmodified, right? So in this case, it was modified, but having that dietary change caused it to become unmodified, and having another dietary change caused this one to become unmodified, and that can actually change the gene activity that's downstream. 
And so in a nutshell, the way that looks is that during development, we need this pathway of events to happen in this order in order to get normal development, normal cells, happy, healthy cells, happy, healthy bodies, um, and happy, healthy children. And what happens is if the epigenome is developed during uh, uh, pregnancy, and that regulates gene activity, it turns the genes on that need to be on, the genes off that need to be off, so that you can get development of cells, tissues, and organs. What happens sometimes if you don't have the right diet or you're deficient uh, for certain diets, it's shown that this can dysregulate or disrupt that epigenome, like I showed you in the last slide. This can change the gene activity, and this can lead to abnormal development. And that's what is attributed or contributes to disease or disease susceptibility. And so that's how we are studying whether dietary changes at this level may or may not affect disease or disease susceptibility um, down that pathway. So a couple of things have to happen in between. The other thing that we're really interested in understanding whether those changes during pregnancy affect the child and whether those will affect the grandchildren is it has to be heritable. It has to be passed from parent to child. Um, and that's a pretty straightforward concept. Your parents have one set of genomes, also a set of epigenomes. Those must be passed to the child normally so that that child can develop normally. <clears throat> All right. So I showed you lots of pictures of humans, but I actually mostly work with mice. Um, and this is just the drawing of, of one of our mice. So um, I, uh, we try to do these studies in mice because it's a lot easier, but the idea is to translate these back to humans and try to understand in a model organism what's happening in humans so that we can ask more appropriate questions in, in humans later on. So basically, we, treat these animal, we treated these animals, a group of animals, with a, di a diet that did not have vitamin D in it, and we compared them to animals that had a normal level of vitamin D. So we're just comparing mice without vitamin D to mice with vitamin D, and we're treating them throughout pregnancy. So what does vitamin D deficiency during pregnancy do to these animals' pups? <clears throat> And we started off by looking at this first generation of animals. And we, I think the data I'm showing you is just males. Um, so we just treated mom, let her have her puffs, and then we measured some things in her male children. <clears throat> the first thing we found was that, um, and we did this in two different strains. So I talked a lot about genetic differences in vitamin D outcomes for a reason, because I was setting you up for some of this data. Um, obviously, that's not the only thing that affects vitamin D. Um, so we, treat, we treated um, this first strain with this vitamin D deficient diet. This black bar or dark bar is the normal diet. This white bar is the deficient diet. And so when we measure the vitamin D levels in their blood, we see that there's a significant reduction in the vitamin D levels that they have. That's what we expected. They weren't getting any vitamin D during pregnancy, so their levels of vitamin D plummeted. This is one strain. <clears throat> The next strain that we looked at, strain A and strain B is the second strain. We also saw a decrease in vitamin D levels, but we saw a decrease in vitamin D levels to a slightly lesser extent. So basically, between these two strains of mice, which you can think of maybe as two genetically different individuals, um, we saw that one strain was more severely affected than the other strain. And so we're seeing this genetic differences, difference, not in the it, starting levels of vitamin D, but in how they responded to this depleted diet. <clears throat> the next thing we looked at was pup body weight. So we want to say, are these mice, when they're born, are they weighing more or less? Do they have more fat, less fat? Do they have an obesity type phenotype? And these are adults, right? So they were treated during pregnancy, and then we put them onto normal diet. So they have been on normal diet for quite a while now. Um, but even though they've been on normal diet, we still saw an increase in body weight and an increase in how much fat they had um, in these individuals. And when we look at the other strain, what was interesting is that we didn't see that effect in the other strain. If anything, we saw a decrease in body weight and maybe a decrease in fat mass. And so there's a difference between these two groups of animals that are genetically distinct in how they're responding to vitamin D, both at the levels of vitamin D in mother's blood and in the offspring uh, body weight outcomes. <clears throat> the next thing we did was we looked at this DNA methylation signature that I talked about, this epigenetic outcome, because I want to understand how, the, how those phenotypes are being generated. And I'm sorry, this looks like it moved a little bit. 
Um, and so here we basically looked at that DNA methylation modification in adult liver. So again, these mice are on normal diet. They've been on normal diet for a while. Just their mothers were, during pregnancy were exposed to that deficient diet. And what you can see here is that not all the genes were changed. Some of the genes were, normal, were the same between the normal diet and the deficient diet. And some of the genes were significantly reduced in their methylation signal. So in this case, uh, there was a reduction of about 5% in that methylation signal. When we look at the other strain, remember there are two strains that we looked at. Again, these, neither one of these were changed, but what we saw was that there was also a difference in their methylation change between the two diets. So there's an effect on body weight, an effect, effect of deficiency on body weight, effect of deficiency on methylation, but it's also dependent on their genetic background. <clears throat> so the next thing that we wanted to do was ask, like I said, is this a change that can be transmitted to the next generation? Are these pups going to have normal, healthy children, or are they somehow compromised? <clears throat> And so what we did was we crossed those mice and generated a second generation. So their grandmothers were exposed to dietary deficiency, and now we're looking at their grandchildren. I'll show you a little bit of data from that. Don't get scared. I'm going to walk you through this part. Of me. I'm not going to walk you through all of it. It's basically, don't, don't worry too much about these. Um, basically, each row here is a different time point of these grandchildren's lives. This is when they were adults. This is when they were first born. Um, these are females in this column, these are males in this column, and again, we've got the two strains sort of side by side. And so what we found was that in that grandchildren, uh, in those grandchildren of the mothers that were exposed during pregnancy, we also see body weight changes. We only see them in the very early, off, early stages of development. We don't see them later on in adulthood. But there were changes that were contributed by having that diet during pregnancy, <clears throat> which had not been shown before. When we look at methylation, we also saw methylation changes in that second generation that were not um, uh, uh, that that were contributed to their grand maternal vitamin D levels during pregnancy. <clears throat> and so, what we're working on right now, as the study sort of goes on, is we've looked at a handful of genes, we've looked at a handful of phenotypes. We want to know what's happening across the genome. What about those other 20,000 genes? Are those also being changed? And how does that contribute to phenotypes that might affect um, individuals that are deficient for vitamin D, especially when they're deficient during pregnancy? And this is just a schematic. Ignore the colors for now. Um, just looking at each individual chromosome across 20 chromosomes. So this is the entire genome of these animals. We saw changes across the entire genome. They're a little different in what those changes are, but there were changes across the genome and pretty significant changes. The second thing is when we start to look at where those changes are, what types of genes are affected, we start to see some um, genes that are related to diseases that we know are linked to vitamin D deficiency. So we see a lot of genes linked to cancer. We see a lot of genes linked to development, both postnatal and embryonic development. We see genes linked to reproduction, and we see genes linked to uh, skin disorders. Um, and this is just a, a list of a different way of listing these these genes and the significant values. In case you're interested, these are the number of mul the number of genes that are linked to those different um, types of health outcomes. <clears throat> and so, in conclusion, um, we found that my, my, maternal vitamin D during pregnancy differs cause has a differing effect on the outcomes of vitamin D levels depending on the genetic makeup of that individual. We found that this uh, was related to changes in, so in the pups from that deficiency. We found changes in fat mass as well, which could suggest maybe some sort of, not necessarily obesity related phenotype, but some difference in adiposity in those individuals. We saw changes in the epigenome of the offspring, and now we're starting to look at how those changes uh, differ across the genome, so what other genes might be affected. Um, and we saw that vitamin D deficiency in the grandmother can actually affect both body weight and the epigenome of multiple generations. And finally, we saw that those differences were seemingly dependent on the genetic differences between the two strains. And so this is kind of where we are now, is trying to think about how we can parse apart how those, first of all, how the vitamin D status is related to birth outcomes, 
but also how those genetic differences might contribute to that vitamin D status and those birth outcomes. And that's sort of where the direction that my research is going in now. And so I just want to thank you guys for your really great questions and for listening patiently. And I didn't see anyone fall asleep, so that's good. Um, <laughs> there's always one person. And then uh, I'd really like to thank my lab members. These are some of the great people that work with me in the lab. I'm not doing this work hands-on. I get in there every now and then and get my hands dirty. Jing Zhui, who is one of uh, the trainees in my lab, she's done most of this work. Um, I have some really great collaborators at UNC, at UNC Charlotte, and UNC Chapel Hill. And then I have really, really fantastic funding support. So I will take any questions. Yeah, I'll take any questions now, I think. <laughs> minutes. I think you said 50 minutes. 15, yeah, yeah. So 15, 20 minutes. I've heard, um, I've definitely heard that. And I actually, like I said, I'm not a medical doctor, but I can actually testify to that. My vitamin D levels were low, and I was fortunate enough to have a little time each morning. And so I took 20, actually took 30 minutes a morning, went for a run every morning, and my levels went back to normal. So it does work. <laughs> you have to be diligent about it. And so I think the point is if, if you're not willing to devote that time to getting it through sun, you have to get it through diet, you have to get it through supplementation, you have to get it somehow. Yes? I'm actually not as familiar with the age-related vitamin D um, studies. Martin, do you know the answer to that? Need a little more. <laughs> yeah. Yes. In the attic. If I can verbalize my question, there's a lot of conversation about genetic predispositions. Are you um, or are you a methylator or are you not a methylator? And your genetic predisposition to oh, I can have my genetic type, and I'm not a methylator, so that's going to affect what type of medicine I take. Huh. Okay, so coming from that perspective, my question was that you had mentioned that there is um, a possibility to alter, if I heard you correctly, to alter your genetic, your nutritional, like, so I, I mean, say I'm not a methylator, but I want to be a methylator, then I can improve my probability of being a methylator So you're asking me whether your genetic predisposition, you can overcome your genetic predisposition with diet. That is a loaded question. That's a really hard question to answer. So <laughs> I know what you're saying. I absolutely know what you're saying. Um, so so that, is, that is a very challenging question to answer. Um, I'm not familiar with the term methylator versus non-methylator. Um, Maybe, has, can you explain that a little bit more? Because then maybe I can get more specifically at the methylator, non-methylator question. Well, just in speaking in general terms, it's not about vitamin D, I'm sorry. Right, that's but, okay. Um, there, there is, well, mm -hmm. do you want to take a methylated form, not a methylated oh. form? Oh. And then there's the, also the conversation with folic acid, methylated form of folic acid, not, and I'm just going to Children with ADD, and it's not vitamin D, but I'm just trying to extrapolate. 
Right. I, I think I may understand what you're saying. So, so there are ways in which your diet may be able to overcome some of your genetic predisposition. Not even that one. Let me show you something, something that might be more direct of an answer, if I can get there. Um, oh, geez. This is a long talk. <laughs> All right, here we go. So, so one way that, um, and again, it's, it's a little bit of a hard question to answer because it's going to really be vitamin dependent and genetic change dependent, right? So it's really going to depend on what genetic sequence you have that's causing you to be susceptible to whatever um, health outcome or disease you're talking about. But I will say, um, for example, if you think about genetic differences in these specific parts of the vitamin D pathway, you could think about the idea that if I have a genetic change that's allowing me not to convert, um, it's not allowing me to convert this form of vitamin D into this form of vitamin D, I might be able to bypass that deficiency by taking in the active form of vitamin D. So that is one way that you might be able to bypass those genetic channels or genetic pathways in your body. But it's very much vitamin dependent, whether you can access this particular form of the vitamin that you need. Um, so yeah, so I would say that's possible, depending on the diet. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I think my question may tie into slide 48. Mm. <laughs> I love it. Very specific. Let's see. It might be easier. Actually, I'm not going to mess with that because it's a PC and I don't know how to use it. 48. While you're working your way, I hope I remembered that right. So while you're working your way forward with that, we know from the Dutch winter studies that the impact of a pregnant female, the grandchildren of a pregnant female during the Dutch winter uh, is, is multi-generational. Um, and I'm crosswalking this to the epidemic of obesity in society today, and I'm thinking through what major change may have happened uh, in grandma's age right. uh, today. Um, and I'm wondering about reversing the epigenetic footprint or thumbprint, if you will, that may have occurred back then. And, right. Um, yes. Is it this one? This is slide 48. But. Okay, this gets, what I took from this is uh -huh. essentially based on genotype, some profiles may have a larger impact from grandma's diet than other grandmas, but mm -hmm. it may also be true that the grandchildren may have a larger reverse effect. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, Right. So I think I think basically what you're asking me is let's let's assume grandma is not different like my my example. Let's say grandma is the same, her deficiency levels are the same, her child outcome is the same. But if whether or not those children are exposed to differences that might rescue the effects that they experience yeah. from grandma. The grandchildren. The grandchildren exactly. Um, yeah, so so we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Um, <laughs> That's definitely been shown, like you said, multiple generations of inheritance of effects. And this is one example, but it's also been shown in the Dutch famine study and other uh, human studies. Um, the challenge with fixing that effect is understanding what's causing it, which a lot of times we don't know exactly what causes it, and how to fix that one effect without fixing changing other effects. And the reason I say that is because I may have identified one gene that's changed, right? And even if I say this change is linked to that body weight difference, I've got 20,000 other genes in my genome. And so one of the things that's actually really cool right now is something called genome editing, right? Um, where they're starting to be able to go in and target specific genes or specific regions of the genome and change those regions into something else back to normal or, or whatnot. The other thing that I'm going to propose is sort of a little bit of a, a devil's advocate here is one of the hypotheses about 
things like obesity and how famine during development might contribute to obesity in the next generation, um, is that that was actually uh, came about as a protective mechanism. So if you think about that child being exposed to nutrient deficient environment, their goal now is to hold on to as many nutrients that they can. Um, and so that's the thrifty hypothesis. This is not my hypothesis. Um, <laughs> this is a, a well-known hypothesis um, by David Barker. But the idea is that some of the phenotypes we're seeing now are actually adaptations to what's happened generations ago. So then that also poses a little bit of a challenge on how to fix it. Because if our body has now adjusted to uh, holding on to more nutrient or receiving more nutrient, um, and that's leading to obesity, then again, it's a question of finding out what's causing that change in the genome, fixing that particular change and moving forward. So I don't think we're there yet, but that's where we're, that's what we're interested in. That's where we're going with it. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Oh, God, that's such a good question. Um, I do not off the top of my head. Um, there, was, there was one, I, honestly, I can never pronounce the names of these drugs. I think they do that intentionally. <laughs> and so I can never remember them. There were a couple that were related to um, uh, 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 seizures, Car carbon, carbamidazole, bendazine. There you go. He knows, he's an, he's an MD, so he knows how to pronounce these words. Yeah, so, so that's one example. Um, there were a couple of other ones, and actually if you either, um, it's really, it's pretty easy to find it online associated with the drug that you're taking, and also your doctor will be able to, or your pharmacist will be able to tell you specifically whether it interferes. There's a lot more literature now than there used to be on which drugs interfere with vitamin D, and so there's some drugs where as soon as they give you the drug, they'll give you a vitamin D pill as well, just so that you're making sure you're staying sufficient. So I would talk to the doctor about the individual drugs. Yes? research and um, I would have to look through it and sort of parse it out and look at case controls what they what they uh, corrected for um, and how directly that stress was measured because sometimes stress has a secondary effect and so there's an in intermediate between the stress and the outcome and so it's a matter of whether those studies have really gone in and parsed that out um, if anyone else has read this literature on stress and vitamin D levels, feel free to, have you seen anything? I haven't seen any papers on it, but um, there's a, there's a, I'm, I'm sorry, just give me one minute. There's a lot of, there are a lot of, hmm, how do I say this? Misleading information on the internet about vitamin D and its links. And when I say that, it's not because necessarily people are intending to be misleading, it's because the studies, like I said, were not a direct question. It was an association or there was some intermediate that they didn't measure. And so getting at those types of questions is really hard, but it can be done if the study's done the right way. So I would just take it with a little bit of air caution. Yes. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yes.
I think I think what you're bringing up is a really good point. So it's cause versus effect. And that's one of the big challenges with a lot of studies in humans and why I do studies in the mouse and then try to take it to humans. Because in humans, it's really, really hard to know what comes first and what comes after. And so in terms of defining cause and effect, it's, it's very challenging. It's not impossible, though, but it's very challenging. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, there are a lot of, a lot of, yes, there are a lot of studies on vitamin D and fatigue. Um, I don't know that literature very well, to be honest with you, um, but yeah, there are links between vitamin D and fatigue. Um, well, you can, I mean, you can, you can exercise them. Yeah, you can exercise mice and see how fast they run out of the ability to exercise. Um, hmm, let me think, let me think, let me think. Let me, let me talk to you afterwards maybe about that a little bit more. Fatigue and vitamin D. Yes, please. I do not know the answer to that question. So you're asking me if different types of vitamin D supplements? Um, I don't know. It's a good question. Why would you expect it to be different? Um, other than the different forms of vitamin D, in terms of D2 versus D3, I know there's some differences in the availability of those two types of vitamin D in the body. To my knowledge, if it's D3 from one source versus another source, your body's going to see D3. It's going to see that chemical structure. Um, the D2 tends to have a lower <clears throat> binding affinity to the compound that transports it from the liver to the kidney, and so the D3 tends to get excreted, uh, metabolized more quickly and excreted more quickly. But in terms of differences between sources of D3, to my understanding, the body recognizes D3 as D3 regardless of where it comes from. <clears throat> yes, it is fat soluble. Yes, it is. I was going to maybe, oh, I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> Uh, any other questions that I may or may not know the answer to? Yes. Vitamin K2. No, I have not studied vitamin K at all, to be honest with you. Oh, well, Dr. Kohlmeyer apparently is an expert in vitamin K, so <laughs> he will be glad to talk to you about vitamin K. <laughs> I am actually a geneticist that's uh, gotten into vitamin D because it's so interesting. The genetic pathways are so interesting and important. And we know so little about how they affect birth outcomes. Um, but yeah, I have not studied vitamin K. So, any other questions? I'll take yes. Twin mice. Ah, all of my mice are twin mice. No, so so mice have litters of uh, between four to fourteen. Uh, babies at a time, so um, uh, uh, fraternal twins. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. So these these are these are mice that are not genetically identical. Um, so they're not monozygotic twins, but they're all in the same uterine environment. And you're asking me what about them now? Mm -hmm. 
So you're asking me whether mice that are in the same womb together have more similarities in their response to vitamin D compared to mice from different litters? We have not asked that question yet. It's a good question, but we haven't asked that question yet. Um, because these distributions are so tight, these are coming from different, different litters, by the way. You probably can't see the individual data points, but we're looking at about individuals from five different litters. Um, and the distributions are pretty tight, so if there is a difference between uh, individuals in the womb versus out of the womb, it would be very small. We haven't specifically tested for it, but it would be pretty small. Uh, so most of the effect that we're seeing is due to the diet and not due to the litter. Yeah, I'm happy. I'll, I'll be around for a little bit. <laughs>